Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to yet another WatchGuard Security Week in Review, the video podcast that quickly summarizes the biggest information and network security stories each week and shares some practical security tips along the way. As always, I'm your host and all-around security professional, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting January 6, 2014. I have five stories to cover, so let's jump right in with a warning for our European Yahoo users. During the week, a security company called Fox IT discovered that the ads on Yahoo were redirecting uh, visitors to malicious websites. It turns out that bad guys use some cross-site scripting flaws in some of these ad programs to inject an iframe that redirected Yahoo visitors to a website that used an exploit kit, a new exploit kit called Magnitude. Now, Magnitude is an exploit kit that largely leverages Java vulnerabilities to force drive-by downloads on visitors. So anyways, this particular hijack happened between December 31st and January 4th. So if you're a European user that visited Yahoo during that time and you haven't patched Java, you might want to check your computer for malware. Now Yahoo has since cleaned up these infected ads, but here are a few takeaways. First, if you use Java, be sure to update it very, very regularly. Bad guys are targeting it right now. And finally, if you're a web developer, you really should check out OWASP and consider using secure coding practices to avoid the type of web application flaws that allow these iframe injections so that your site doesn't suffer the same problem as Yahoo and other ad sites do. Next is a story I found interesting because it shows how you can use the legal system to pursue unknown hackers. During the week, we learned that LinkedIn is suing an unknown party for hacking their website, essentially for, for uh, breaking their EULA by using all kinds of, of evasion technologies to scrape LinkedIn profiles. Essentially, LinkedIn learned that uh, unknown parties were using Amazon Web Services and lots of computing power to try to create many, many fake LinkedIn accounts. And then they were uh, overtaking the CAPTCHA system and using these accounts to scrape the profile of hundreds of thousands of LinkedIn users. Now, they currently don't know who's doing this, but this is where it becomes uh, interesting from a legal security perspective. They've created a lawsuit to actually sue the people that are breaking their EULA and, and, and doing this to scrape profiles. And the reason they're doing this is because having a lawsuit allows them to go to ISPs and authorities and other people and kind of force ISPs and service providers to share the details about the customers that happen to be using those IP addresses or happen to be using the Amazon Web Service domains. And by having this lawsuit, they can uncover the identity of these particular hackers. So this is not a totally new legal strategy. Over the past few years, I've been talking about how Microsoft has been taking down botnets. And often Microsoft does not know the actors that are creating these botnets. They just know the command and control servers, and Microsoft has been successful in actually using these sorts of lawsuits to either force ISPs to uncover the identity of these bot herders and or to even close down the ISPs themselves because they were unwilling to shut down the herders themselves. So anyways, I just find this an interesting legal tactic to try to catch some of the malware herders out there. Next up is another legal story. It's one about a good intention 16-year-old Australian hacker who might face some legal troubles because of his disclosure. During the week, there's a story about a 16-year-old Melbourne boy who actually found vulnerabilities in a particular Australian government site. And uh, most people suspect it was a SQL injection vulnerability that he found, and it allowed him to find a lot of personal information about uh, people that worked at this government entity, including their uh, phone numbers, names, addresses, and some credit card details. In any case, this teenager says he accidentally stumbled upon this flaw, and he actually reported it to the website owners themselves and waited two weeks for some sort of response. But after not getting a response, he decided to report it to the journalists who then contacted the company. But rather than try to talk to the 16-year-old the boy and, and fix the problem, the company chose to report the boy to the authorities. Now, this is kind of an interesting 
interesting story about security research and disclosure. I go both ways. I actually don't like researchers that do full disclosure without reporting things to the vendor. But in this case, this 16-year-old this boy seems to have reported it. His goal was to actually disclose this so they would fix the flaw. So the way they responded to it is very old school, and in my opinion, is not a way vendors or governments or organizations should respond to good intention disclosure. On the flip side, the one thing that is not clear is whether or not the 16-year-old boy ended up actually exploiting the SQL injection vulnerability to prove it. I will say that if you actually exploit the vulnerabilities you find, while you may be technically doing it to show a proof of concept, it is kind of gray legal area and can get you in trouble. So pen testers out there, be very careful. So I'm kind of biased because it matches one of my security predictions for the year, but one of the biggest stories this week was news of a new piece of ransomware that seems to be a copycat of CryptoLocker being discovered on the hacker underground. A well-known uh, malware research group called Malware Must Die uh, shared information about a new piece of malware that's loosely being called Power Locker or Prison Locker. And this is malware that actually does not seem to be spreading in the wild. Rather, Malware Must Die infiltrated many underground forums and found a particular malware author who's advertising his new uh, ransomware malware. And this ransomware seems very similar to CryptoLocker. It uses very strong encryption. It also extorts people in a similar way as CryptoLocker does. It will encrypt a bunch of files, give you a time period for decrypting it, which is customizable for the attacker, and tries to get you to pay through Bitcoin and a few other online currencies. On top of that, it seems to be trying to become even more advanced by using a lot of evasion techniques, uh, ways to hide from different security programs, to make sure that it can boot in safe mode and can work work on 64-bit operating systems. So one of my predictions this year, based on CryptoLocker and other ransomware trends, is that you should expect more ransomware this year. And this particular power locker underground uh, malware as a service offering seems to support that we will be seeing more ransomware this year. Now the good news is if you use various anti-malware programs out there, you should be relatively safe if you keep them up to date. That said, another tip would be to back up your files regularly. If you're not backing up files, you should just in case you ever get infected. And on top of that, you want to make sure to consider offline backups too, ones that are not connected to a network, because I expect to see ransomware that tries to get to your online backups as well in the future. So the final story for this episode isn't the biggest, but it's one I want to share with the fellow gamers out there. And it's a new piece of malware that again targets World of Warcraft users. But this is an interesting piece of malware, and it specifically targets World of Warcraft users who are actually using relatively good security using World of Warcraft or Blizzard's own two-token authenticator. If you followed my past World of Warcraft hacking stories, you probably remember me mentioning that Blizzard responded by releasing an optional two-token authenticator that you can purchase for very cheap from Blizzard. And this little device creates a one-time password that you can also enter along with your normal password to offer a two-token authentication. However, this week Blizzard warned of a new Trojan that's actually using key logging to not only steal your password, but to steal this second token authentication from your computer real time. So when you enter this second token, it will actually log that and it will prevent your authentication from reaching Blizzard servers and instead the attacker's software will automatically log in as you and change your credentials and then you can no longer uh, access your site. And by the way, Blizzard has since learned that this particular Trojan seems to be spreading via a fake curse client. Curse client is one of the clients you can get for World of Warcraft and other games to load uh, modifications and stuff. So if you've gone to a third party site and downloaded the fake curse client, you may have this Trojan. In any case, if you're a World of Warcraft user, watch out for this, use antivirus. But what I think is more interesting about this story is the security consideration having to do with two-token authentication. We often talk about two-token authentication is a great way to solve the authentication password. Sometimes people 
don't use passwords, so a lot of people don't think passwords are strong enough. So one, one quick fix is using multi-factor authentication. It can really improve your security. But one thing that's not often mentioned is the way that second factor authentication is communicated to a server. Is it a communicated in band, meaning is it communicated in the same request that your password is communicating, or is it communicating out of band, meaning does it use a separate communication vector? And if you know anything about two token authentication, it's better for out of band second token authentication because an attacker would have to infiltrate two channels in order to, to intercept and steal your credentials. So that's one of the reasons I love SMS as a second token of authentication. You're going to send your password and your username over your computer's network, but if you use SMS applications to get the second token, that's going to happen over another 3G or, or wireless provider network that's separate, usually from your computer's network. So that is out-of-band authentication versus in-band authentication. So the quick practical tip is if you're considering two-token authentication, you must realize that out-of-band methods are much more secure than in-band ones. Well, that's all for this week. As usual, there's a lot of other stories, so be sure to visit the WatchGuard Security Center blog, where I'll have a blog post about this video, which will also contain a reference section with a lot of links to other stories. On top of that, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdapt, or follow my company WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.